With pedals, an eight shifter and a wheel now all complete, there's only one part missing to finish off my completely DIY sim setup, a frame to mount it all on. We also need to finish off the wiring for all the main components and finally integrate everything together. So let's get started. Ever since the first of my simulator content went up right back in January, I've been watching Marketplace for cheap car seats. I was trying to keep my seat budget under 100 bucks so most of the results were either ripped, damaged or just covered in questionable stains. Oh, what is that? But right after the last video, this one popped up. It's a seat from one of the cheaper next level racing simulator frames. It looks like it's in great condition, but apparently the seat back has a lot of free play, so something must be broken. But for 50 bucks, it's worth a shot, so I jumped in the car and made the two hour round trip to pick it up. Luckily, with just a couple of wire ties to cut, the frame of the seat is easily removed, and I think we've found the problem. This whole seat is only supported by one side of this flimsy, thin steel frame. No wonder it broke. I could have a go of welding this myself, but thin metal like this can be a challenge to weld. Luckily, I know a good boiler maker who's happy to help. We cut up a bit of steel rod that's about the size of the inside of the tube and then hammered it up the inside to realign everything and make it stronger than it was to begin with. With a couple of quick welds and a spray of some paint to stop it rusting, it's back together and stronger than it was when it was new. Now all I need to do is get a basic model of it into CAD so I can design the frame. The only part I really need an accurate model of is the seat rails, but having a rough visual representation of the seat in the model would help too. I took a couple of reference photos with a tape measure in the shot so I could scale them and then trace the outlines of both the seat base and the back. Next, I took a couple of rough measurements just so I could make some semi-convincing cutouts in the outlines so they at least loosely represented the seat in the model. The geometry on the backrest is a bit messed up, but it'll do for what I need. Finally, I finished up the seat rails and included them in the seat base model so I can design brackets that will bolt up to them properly. Now for the frame design. There's lots of different material options I've seen people use for their sim rigs. I've even seen PVC pipe used successfully. I could go cheap and use wood or steel, but I want this frame to be light and rigid enough that I can potentially fit a motion system to it in the future if I wanted. In my opinion, that means it needs to be aluminium. I started out by looking at some of the extrusion based designs on the Open Sim Racing site for inspiration. The plans cost money but you can look at the cut list for free to gauge how long the parts are. The minimalist design is mostly made up of 8040 and 4040 extrusion which cost me about 48 and 33 dollars per meter respectively. That means I would be up for about 520 dollars just for the extrusion if I built this design. I do like the flexibility that extrusion offers, but I don't think I need it everywhere, so I'm only going to use it selectively. I stumbled across some offcuts of 70 by 30 aluminium RHS with a 3mm wall thickness on Marketplace. Even when new, this stuff is only about $18 a metre, which is much more reasonable and it should be more than strong enough for the base of our sim rig. It does come with some challenges that extrusion wouldn't have, but we'll get to that in a minute. One of my other goals with this rig is to be able to mount my pedals upside down for a more realistic feel. To do this using minimal extra extrusion, I'm going to angle my main steering wheel supports back by 30 degrees. This way, I can attach the pedals directly to the steering uprights with a simple laser cut bracket that will allow me to adjust their angle. Obviously, adjusting the pedals height will result in a slight movement forward or backwards, but the seat rails and the steering wheel are adjustable and we can mount them wherever we need to get the feel right, so I'm not too concerned. I've measured the position I think I need things in roughly, so hopefully this will all work out. Let's get started on the base. In an effort to make it as compact as possible, I've cut the overall length of mine down to just 1260 millimeters. This size fits me well, but I'm only about five foot nine. So if you're much taller than I am, or you have very long legs, I'd suggest bumping the length back out to about 1450 millimeters. We need to cut two side beams at 1200 and two cross members at 520 mil. Next, we need a way to join the parts together. And this is where it gets tricky. Because the walls of this tube are only three millimeters thick, we can't rely on tapping threads into the aluminium for any joints that might pull against the threads or require the bolts to be done up particularly tightly. So for the joints that hold the bottom frame together, we really need to bolt right through the tube with a nut on the other side. To make this easier, I've 3D printed a jig that I can simply clamp onto the tube and use to drill out the holes where I need them. We need these two holes in both sides and both ends of all of the pieces we've cut. The measurements to cut and drill all of these parts will be up on the GitHub for you, so don't worry too much about the specifics for now. With all of that out of the way, now we need to join these parts together. 
I'm sure that the solution I've come up with will be controversial, but I'm going to 3D print all of the joiners for this bottom frame in Petching. I've used six walls with 50% infill on these parts, so they're extremely solid. They just slip into the ends of the extrusion and we bolt right through the lot with M8 bolts. I actually paused these prints halfway through and installed an M8 nut into this hole, which we will later use for our adjustable feet. Now for the steering uprights. I'm using 80-40 extrusion for these to ensure they are strong enough and to give us the adjustability that we need for the steering wheel and pedals. These pieces are 745mm in length with a 30 degree cut on one end. To attach them to the base, we first need to thank this video sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWay are a long time sponsor of the channel and have helped bring all of these projects to life for us. They've kindly provided some of the laser cut parts today and they are powder coated in this lovely gloss black. Getting parts like this made is as easy as uploading a file, selecting a material, quantity and finish and hitting the submit request button. If you want to have parts folded like these seat brackets, you will need to provide a simple drawing along with the part that specifies the angle of the folds. PCBWay also does machining, 3D printing and of course PCB fabrication. So make sure you check them out at the link in the video description next time you need their services. The steering upright brackets bolt onto the extrusion with these sliding nuts. These things are almost a dollar each locally, so I'm really glad I didn't build this whole thing with extrusion. The bottom four holes will bolt onto the RHS base frame, but first, let's install the seat brackets. We should be able to just drill and tap holes for these ones, as the load on these bolts is only ever going to be perpendicular to the bolts, and the brackets naturally will push outwards when there's weight on the seat, so there's very little chance of these bolts getting ripped out of the frame. I've positioned the brackets 35mm from the end of the frame and lined up the bottom edge of the seat bracket with the bottom edge of the frame. Then I'll drill the top two mounting holes out to 5mm and run an M6 tap through the hole and repeat the process for the other side. Just be careful when you do up the bolts not to over tighten them as you will easily strip these threads out if you do. I'm going to leave my seat brackets in this position for now but if you need to lift your seat up higher you can move them to any set of holes you'd like. Now all we need to do is bolt through the seat rails into the brackets with the M8 bolts and that's it for the seat. Let's do the steering supports next using this 4040 extrusion. There are two different lengths, one for your shifter side and one for your entry side. The shifter side is 550mm long with a 30 degree cut on both ends and the entry side is 400mm with the same angled end cuts. While we're here, we'll also cut the last bit of 8040 extrusion for the steering wheel support. This one is 490mm in length. The length of this part will vary depending on the thickness of your steering support brackets. Mine is cut assuming the brackets are 5mm thick, but you will need to adjust either way depending on what thickness material you use here. Alright, now we have everything we need to assemble the wheel and the pedal support. These brackets bolt onto either end of the steering wheel support with M8 countersunk bolts and then slide down between our two uprights and bolt into the slots with more of the T-nuts. This bracket allows up to 20 degrees of rotation, so you should be able to get your steering wheel angle just right. Next, the supports bolt up to the 8040 using these brackets. On the shifter side, they should be about 503mm up from the edge of the shorter side of the main upright, but it's probably easier if you just sit the whole lot on a flat surface and adjust the position until the bottom of the main beam and the support is sitting flat. The process is exactly the same on the other side. Now, we need to mount the pedals. I've cut some new bits of 2020 extrusion to 496mm and bolted them between the laser cut pedal support brackets. Like the steering support beam, the length of these depends on the thickness of your brackets. Mine have been cut to suit 3mm brackets which should be ample to support the pedals. I've also rearranged the pedals to get them back into the correct order for inverted mounting. And I've turned the throttle pedal support upside down to get the pedal into a more natural position. These brackets bolt in between the steering uprights using a couple more T-nuts and allow up to 40 degrees of angle adjustment for the pedals. Last but not least, the steering wheel bolts up to this plate and then bolts down onto the steering support beam with a few more T-nuts. And that's it! The whole steering assembly is now complete. You can now sit the whole assembly on the RHS frame and adjust everything until you're happy with the position before finally drilling and tapping the holes into the bottom frame to bolt it all in place. The shifter just bolts up using this bracket and then we're almost finished with the mechanical bits. I bought these adjustable feet from Bunnings so we can ensure the frame is sitting nice and level even if the floor is a little uneven. They just wind up into the bottom of the 3D printed corners. And that's it for the mechanical stuff now. Now we need to talk about wiring. I was originally hoping to incorporate all of our controls through the FF Beast wheel, but because our motor controller doesn't break out all of the available GPIO pins, we simply don't have enough of them to make it work. 
I could solder tiny wires to the spare pins of the main controller to access those GPIO pins, but then it would be pretty hard for you guys to follow along at home if you don't have experience doing fine pitch soldering. So let's leave the shifter as its own device for now and just incorporate the pedals into the FF Beast wheel using the GPIO pins that we do have available. As far as I know, there is no support in the FF Beast firmware for a digital load cell interface like the HX711 we used in the previous video. So to get our brake pedal working, we will have to come up with a different solution. I've seen a couple of good designs for some DIY load cell amplifiers, which we could build, but I was hoping to find something we can just buy and use. So I picked up this cheap INA 333 board from AliExpress. I haven't been able to find much info on this board or any actual success stories using it, but it was cheap and the INA333 chip on the board should do the job, so it's worth a shot. On this board, the ground and VCC pins are shared between the load cell and the power supply. The green and white wires from the load cell go to VIN plus and VIN minus respectively. If the AliExpress listing is to be believed, the input voltage range on this board can be anywhere from 1.85 to 5.5 volts, so we should be okay to power this directly from the motor controller. The VREF pin needs to be connected to ground, and then we can short out the potentiometer with a wire from here to here, just to ensure we're getting full gain out of the amplifier. I accidentally ripped a resistor off the board while I was messing around with different options, so just ignore the glue and magnet wire I had to use to fix it. The output is measured between V out and ground, and it looks like it's working perfectly. The wiring for the Hall Effect sensors doesn't need to change, so all we need to do now is connect it all up. We need five connections in total for the signals, from the pedals and then power and ground. You can use whatever connector you want, but I picked up this six pin DIN connector because I can just drill a hole to mount it in the back cover of the steering wheel housing. Since none of the connections need to carry a large amount of power, this six core alarm cable should be good enough to carry our signals from the pedals up to the steering wheel. On the back of the DIN connector, I've soldered up wires to connect to the O-Desk. The signal wires should go to the pins labeled GPIO 1, 2, and 3, and then we will take the 3.3 volt and ground connections from the next connector over. Now that's complete, we can finally cover it all in heat shrink and zip tie it into place. Don't worry if you didn't catch something in the video, I've added a wiring diagram to the GitHub page to show how all of this connects, to hopefully make it as clear as possible for you guys. Last but not least, we need to get the software set up. In order to add additional axes to the FF Beast wheel, we need to pay for a license. It's only 10 euros, which is about 17 Australian dollars, but just be careful because it's a per controller license, meaning if you damage something during the build, you won't be able to transfer the license to a new controller. With the license applied, we can access the periphery tab where we will set pins one, two, and three as analog inputs. The analog axes option should light up and allow us to set upper and lower dead zones for each axis, which we can work out by testing using the VKB Joy Tester tool. Just move the control from the minimum to maximum position and record the values it displays. We then need to divide those values by two and enter them into the upper and lower dead zone fields accordingly. And that's it. Let's give it a test. Wow, what a difference a proper seating position makes. The frame is nice and sturdy, and now that I've got a solid base, I've been able to dial the power on the steering wheel all the way up to enjoy a more realistic level of feedback. Having the pedals actually mounted to something means I can now consider upping the spring and dampener weights to make them feel as realistic as possible. The total build price came out to about 690 Australian dollars, or a little less than 450 Freedom dollars, which seems pretty cheap for an aluminium sim rig. Half the price of the project is just in the laser cutting, so if you wanted to cut some corners, you could just print the brackets out onto paper and transfer them to plywood or even steel with some simple hand tools. The seat brackets would obviously still need to be steel if you stick with this design, but you'll probably need something different depending on which seat you get anyway, so use your imagination and see what you can come up with. There's still a few more things I need to really finish off my fully DIY sim setup, but this has definitely been one of the more important projects and I'm glad it's now ticked off the list. 
Don't forget to let me know in the comments what you think I should build next, and I'll see you all in the next one. Thanks for watching.